Um, when I talk about this sort of thing, one of the uh, one of the questions that immediately pops up is, you know, why do you act why do you study these things? Well, the you know the first answer is of course because it's fun, uh, but on the other hand, fun doesn't pay the bills. So uh, the the sort of the better answer is that because it's actually relevant. You know, the uh, and and uh, my motivation for for doing this sort of work is that. Uh, is my, my strong feeling that we don't know where we're going until we know where we've been. And uh, so a lot of this uh, talk will be about where we've been so that we can uh, look into the future and, and see what, uh, what uh, the future has to hold for, for, uh, for large carnivores and for uh, nature in general. Uh, so uh, hominids, carnivores, and the origin of the Anthropocene. Uh, and I'll start from the back with the Anthropocene, or from the fun front, if you, if you prefer to look from, pr from the present into the past. Um, so the Anthropocene uh, is sort of a household word these days, although it's not really very clear what we mean by the Anthropocene. Uh, I think to most people, it's sort of a vague time period in which human influence on the planet has in some way been significant or irreversible or you know, those sorts of things. However, uh, there's a strong movement in geology to define the Anthropocene as a geological time period, a geological epoch, to, to uh, succeed the present epoch, which is the Holocene, which started about uh, 10,000 years ago after, at the end of the, the, the latest ice age. Uh, and now people are talking about, you know, what is the Anthropocene? When did it start? And there's, there's a whole cottage industry of, of papers uh, being produced on various ideas of when the Anthropocene actually started. And uh, you know, one, of the, one of the popular alternatives, one of the latest alternatives, is in April 1947, 1945, uh, the first uh, nuclear tests in the atmosphere, uh, which gives a, you know, but is, is there really a point in having a geological epoch which is like 70 years old? Uh, whereas, you know, normal geological epochs are tens of millions of years old. So, um, so my talk will, will, will address in part that issue, in part uh, talk about human carnivore uh, interactions in, the deep, in, in deep time. Uh, we, know, we all know about human carnivore interactions. You just need to go to a... a any sort of hearing or symposium in this country about humans and wolves, then you get the then you get the the, the whole gamut of opinions about human carnivore interactions. So, when did the uh, uh, Anthropocene actually begin? I mean, when people started discussing the Anthropocene, the general idea was sort of that it uh, it began. Uh, with the Industrial Revolution in either the late 18th or the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the sort of uh, dark satanic mills uh, that, uh, uh, that we read and sing about, or, or that people read and sang about back in the day. Um, and, and sure, that's, that's when, when we can see an, a major increase in in uh, global pollution uh, and in uh, the, uh, the amount of, radio of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere starts here. But there are other options. Um, so this is one where, uh, let's see if I can use this pointer without uh, pointing at somebody. Um, so this first little curve here, um, this curve, the red curve here is uh, the amount of, uh, of radiation striking the Earth from the sun. Uh, and this is, uh, so we're talking here about uh, 20,000 20, years over here and zero over here. So, and this, we know this varies. This has been known for a long time that this varies. And um, it's due to uh, some astronomical parameters called the Milankovitch parameters. Uh, that has to have to do with, with the, the sun's precession, with, with the ellipt ellipticity of the sun's orbit around the, uh, around the Earth, those sorts of things. They generate this curve where, where 
uh, over the course of, of, of thousands of years, uh, uh, there is more or less radiation that's, uh, that uh, strikes the Earth. Uh, and uh, these two, these two uh, jagged curves here are temperature curves derived from uh, two um, drillings into I two ice cores, one in the Antarctic and one in Greenland. And what we can see here is that, and if you follow this back, this would also be true, that uh, the temperature curve generally follows the, the, the radiation curve. So the more sunlight that hits the Earth, the warmer it gets, which you, know, you kind of expect that to do be true. But uh, around here, five or 6,000 years ago, these two curves part company. Uh, and we can see it a little more clearly here so that we have uh, we have, uh, this is the natural, and this is, what we, this is what we would expect the temperature to do, but this is what actually happens. It starts going up rather than going down. Um, and so we should be, you know, we should be in an ice age now. But um, we're obviously, I mean, yes, it's cold outside, but we don't have three kilo kilometers of ice covering us. So it's, um, and uh, so the inference is that human activity has created the, ha has lengthened the interglacial period for us. So we, we you know, we, we done this ourselves. Uh, and the idea is that this, is, this uh, uh, coincides with the first major wave of farming. Uh, and farming, you know, not a problem, but in order to, create land for farming, forests were cut down, and forests are reservoirs of carbon. And all that carbon was, uh, went up in, into the atmosphere. And according to this idea, did this. So uh, we could say that the Anthropocene actually started 5,000 years ago, uh, rather than 200 years ago. Uh, and then we come to, to the sort of point of view that I'm, uh, I'm going to mention. Or, or, or talk about that. Uh, if we're going to talk about permanent effects on, uh, on the Earth, then we may as well go back to the, to the first identifiable permanent effects of human activity on the Earth. And uh, according to my analyses, these, are, uh, the, these have to do with human, with the first uh, change of human diet from being based on 98% vegetable matter and a little meat thrown in when, uh, when they could get hold of it, to including a significant amount of, of, of intentionally acquired uh, meat, uh, meat protein. So, and, uh, so the discussion that I will, uh, I will present is, is based on, on when did this happen? Well, first of all, did it actually happen? Were, was human activity at the start of, of, uh, of basically the origin of our own genus, Homo, uh, so, uh, so pervasive that it actually influenced the fauna to the degree where there were actually extinctions? And extinction is forever, so, uh, unless you're a molecular geneticist these days when extinction no longer is forever, but uh, back then it was certainly forever. Uh, so that would be a permanent effect of humans on uh, the environment, because if you take out some take out some animals, that will change the balance of the other fauna, so that uh, you know, there will be a permanent change in uh, in the environment. Uh, and uh, so. There are two things here that we, we need to consider. One is human evolution, and one is uh, what the carnivores were like, because uh, my take on this is that what carnivores were actually interacting here with here, or what humans were interacting here with is, is carnivores. They were competing for the same, for the same animal foodstuffs, either, either by, uh, I guess, what we would, if these were all carnivores, we would call this kleptoparasitism, where one, one carnivore steals food from another carnivore. Uh, and we believe that that is something that occurred uh, on a regular basis back uh, 2,000, 2 million odd years ago. Uh, that 
humans became capable or, or interested in uh, acquiring uh, scavenge uh, from either just dead animals, animals do die spontaneously, if you will, uh, or from carnivore kills. Uh, in this case, a somewhat antiquated view of, of what our ancestors might have looked like, but here they're, they're, they're throwing stones to chase away hyenas, which is certainly within the realm of possibility. Uh, the other option is, of course, that they actually actively hunted. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about these things. Uh, the, the smart money these days is, is that hunting is actually a relatively late activity, uh, whereas this began quite early. Um, so to, to some checks and balances here, and that is that, that uh, there are two ways of looking at this. Either everything is due to climatic change, certainly possible. Uh, so in, in order to be able to demonstrate that, that biotic interactions between humans and carnivores, between carnivores and prey, actually had a significant effect, uh, we have to eliminate uh, the effects of climate. And that's not an easy thing to do two million years ago, because we, you know, we're not there to watch it happen. Uh, s but um, we do know quite a lot about the environment uh, and, and climate over the course of the last five million years, which this, uh, which this records. So here you have uh, one, of those, uh, one of those cycles, basically showing how, how the climate has fluctuated, um, there's some major events here in, in global climate transitions. The ons uh, around 2.5 million years ago, we get the first northern hemisphere glaciations. Uh, uh, s just under 2 million years ago, we get the first, uh, the onset of what's called walk walker circulation, which is what, uh, which is the, oce the oceanographic uh, process that generates uh, El Nino and La Nina events. Uh, when walker circulation is normal, they don't occur. When it weakens, you get an, an El Nino. When it gets too strong, you get a La Nina. So, so these, are, these are some really a, a important short-term uh, climatic effects. And then up here you get uh, uh, around just or just under a million years ago, there's, there's a major change, a, a major shift in the uh, in the temperature curves where we go from relatively rapid climatic changes to much, much more intense but longer term climatic changes, which is the, uh, the world we're in now, where, we have, where glacial integration cycles are about 100,000 years, and uh, the, glacial, the glacial cycle of that is 90,000 years, and the interglacial is 10,000 years. So uh, we're just lucky we're here when it's nice and nice and warm outside, even if it is zero degrees. Um, but all of this, of course, relates to, uh, to human evolution, uh, because uh, all of these things obviously have n not only affected uh, us up here, where we, it's, you know, it's very easy to demonstrate here, we have, you know, we have no glaciers, and then suddenly a few thousand years later, we have huge masses of ice that cover everything. Uh, in, in Africa, there's, there, there was originally a lot of debate about what this actually meant uh, in, uh, in, in the tropics. Uh, and uh, the original idea was that when, it was when we had glacials here, we had pluvials in Africa where it, where it rained more. Uh, unfortunately, we now know that it's actually the other way around. When we have glacials here, it's, it's drier. In, in, in Africa, and when we have interglacials here, it's wetter. So it's, it's switched around. Um, but certainly, effects in Africa are, if not as physically dramatic, then at least as important to the environment. So you, you get more, you, you have cycles of drier and wetter. And that, of course, ap affects distribution of forests, which in turn affects the distribution of all sorts of animals. Uh, and we can study this by looking at various types of, of, of proxies. Uh, we can look at, this is Mediterranean dust flux, so that, uh, where the premise is that as, uh, when it's drier, more dust is blown out into the sea. 
uh, and when it's wetter, less dust is blown out of the sea. And that relates to glacial interglacial cycles. Uh, I mean, it looks like a mess here, but if you if you uh, if you use the the proper transforms of, of this uh, of this curve, then you can see the actual cyclicity. Um, and you can look at at soil. Uh, these are. Our, uh, measurements of uh, the percentage of, there are two different, plants have two different uh, photosynthetic pathway, pathways, C3 and C4. C4 is, a t C4 plants are typical of, of, of warm uh, landscapes. Uh, and so when you have more C4, well, warm and drier in particular, and when you have, so when you have more warm and dry, you have a larger percentage uh, of C4 plants, which translates into, uh, into a certain balance of, of, uh, of carbon isotopes. So we can say here that over the course of the last four million years, there's been a general drying trend in East Africa, uh, although it's been interrupted many times by, uh, and it's not, uh, it's not necessarily local, but it's, it's, it, this is regional. So if we look locally, there would be, it, it may look slightly different. Uh, and then, of course, we have human evolution. A lot of things happened here. Uh, and I could spend the next two hours talking about this without actually really getting anywhere. Uh, this has been a particularly good or bad year, if you will, for, for the study of human evolution, uh, with two new species named, a new, uh, a new early uh, stone tool culture, and it's all rather bewildering, even to, to, to those who, like me, are sort of forced to follow what's going on here. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say here that we'll, uh, I'll, I'll mention some things uh, later. But the important things to note here is that around here, we get the first appearance of, of, of about 2.6, 2.7 million years, we have the first appearance of our genus, Homo. At that point, they're not that different from their ancestors. Obviously, I mean, when, when, something, when something branches off from its ancestor, the change is, you know, even if you're a devout punctuationalist, change is relatively gradual. You know, so you're not going to see enormous changes immediately. Around, around two million or slightly less, we start seeing the first, our first ancestors who are more or less biologically human, uh, at least below the neck. They still, they still lack a little bit in brain power, but... Uh, but certainly, they are, they, are, uh, they are much more human in terms of, uh, of life history, uh, in terms of uh, body proportions, in terms of a lot of things. Uh, they are more sophisticated tools, et cetera. So the, the major change isn't really when our, when our genus evolves, but when we get, we get to the next level and we get uh, the radiation of, of species or subspecies or whatever you want to call them that, that collectively are known as, uh, as erectines or Homo erectus in a broad sense. And then, you know, we get <laughs> these things leave Africa and, you know, essentially the rest is history. If they didn't leave Africa, we wouldn't be here. But uh, basically, just to give you some sort of idea, um, this is probably the most famous fossil of all uh, early humans, Lucy, uh, or, uh, which is a, who was a member of this species, Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, and uh, some key characters that identify her as opposed to chimpanzees have to do with body proportions. The legs are a little longer, the arms are a little shorter. Uh, torso shape, a little, a little less uh, pyramid-shaped, uh, pelvic shape. Obviously, Lucy was upright, so pel the pelvis had to uh, accommodate to uh, upright posture, as did, knee, as, as did the knees, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of other features that, uh, that, that are in, in, in inextricably linked to uh, upright posture, to, to walking on, on, uh, on two legs. Uh, I mean, this, the, the question of, of, of bipedalism is obviously a central one in, uh, in human evolution. It occurred much earlier than this, somewhere between five and seven million years ago, uh, where we have very few fossils and a very poor idea of what environments these things actually lived in. 
uh, when we get to Australopithecus, we know a lot more about you know, what they looked like, uh, how they got around, uh, what sort of environments they lived, etc. So, so, uh, so the, the bi question of bipedalism, bipedalism is there. We haven't solved it, but there are a lot of people out looking all the time, and uh, you know, some, someday somebody's going to get lucky and find the right thing. Um, out of Africa is, uh, is something that basically coincides with the appearance of, of more advanced Homo. Um, but it is not entirely clear who leaves and when and why. We can't ask. Uh, but uh, if you start calculating you know, possible population sizes and how much they traveled, could, would have traveled per year, it really doesn't take more than you know, a few hundred meters per generation for these people to be out of Africa pretty quickly on a geological time scale. So time is everything here. Uh, I mean, it's not as if somebody all of a sudden got up and said, I want to leave Africa. I don't like it here. Uh, but it's, it's likely that basically you know, population pressure gradually led to, to the, the, uh, the marginal populations to, to move a little further out. And, uh, and when you know, the circumstances, the geographic circumstances were right, they left Africa. Um, this material here, and these are uh, obviously uh, laser scans of skulls. Uh, they are from uh, the earliest known site of Homo outside uh, Africa, which is in the Republic of Georgia, a site called Dmanisi, and they're dated approximately 1.78 million years, give or take a few thousand. That's something I, as an aside, is that, you know, many people have the idea that that, uh, that dating of this sort of thing is very imprecise, but it's gotten remarkably precise over the course of, of the last uh, of, of the last 15 years or so, uh, although it takes you know a nuclear reactor to do this, uh, it's not not something you do in in at, at home in your uh, in your kitchen, but uh, basically at it, you know if you're talking about a time period of uh, two million years or so, which is the sort of time period we're we're discussing here, then the dates are accurate to within one or two parts per thousand, so. Two million plus minus a couple of thousand, which is pretty good. I mean, it doesn't, still not ecological time or, or, or generational time, but it's, you know, it's pretty good if you're looking at something two million years ago. These first humans, uh, you'd think they would come here. You know, life is better here, isn't it? Uh, but no, they went east. They all went east. Uh, they went to Dmanisi in the Caucasus, and uh, we, ha we don't have any from the Indian subcontinent here, but they must have, they must have passed it, because we have them in, in Java about 1.7 1, 1. million years ago, and the same dates in China. And uh, although this track here suggests that they traversed the Indian subcontinent, it may be more likely that they actually hugged the coast it's, it's easier to travel there. They didn't have boats, but certainly, uh, and, they, and they didn't need boats to get over to, to, to these islands because the, uh, the sea level was lower, periodically lower. So uh, at some point they could just walk across. Um, but uh, it, it didn't take very long. And that's, I, that's one of the fascinating things. It's, it's, it only takes a couple of hundred thousand years. And, and it, you know, in the course of, you know, Evolutionary events, that's not very much. There's a second uh, out of Africa, somewhere around uh, one million years, or maybe a little less, where you get these mysterious things called Denisovans that you've probably heard about, uh, uh, identified basically only from DNA. Uh, and uh, the species Homo heidelbergensis, misspelled here, sorry about that. Uh, Americans can't spell German names. Uh, but uh, so that's that's a, a sort of an intermediate out of Africa, and then we get the second out of Africa, or out of Africa two, as we call it, which is the uh, the emergence of our species, 
uh, Homo sapiens out of Africa and into the rest of the world, and uh, where we also have some admixture of various things here and there. Um, and that, uh, that happened somewhere around 100,000 years ago. Some, you know, the dating now, it's, it's a little hard, but somewhere between 70 and 100,000 years ago. Um, important to understanding the relationship of climate to human evolution is the, uh, the uh, question of uh, you know, how did climate change affect human evolution. Uh, what we know is that between four and two million years ago, there was uh, regionally or uh, even locally in, in East Africa a uh, and I'll, I'll show a curve of that later, uh, a relatively strong drying trend, so that it went, w so that large parts of, of East Africa went from, from quite forested to more of a savanna woodland uh, over the course of those two million years. And that affected human evolution so that around 2.5, 2.6, or 2.7 million years ago, we get two different lineages of humans emerging from something like Australopithecus afarensis or something very similar to it. Uh, and one of those is this group, which are called, we used to be called the robust Australopithecines uh, because they were close, when they were found, they were closely allied to Australopithecus. But now we know that they should be regarded as a genus of its own Paranthropus. And what is characteristic of these is that they have huge attachment areas for the chewing muscles. Uh, they have massive cheekbones also for chewing muscles. Enormous uh, cheek teeth, uh, cheek teeth that had a grinding area about three times those of our cheek teeth. So, you know, you might want to be, a, you might want to be a, been a dentist back in those days. Uh, although they had very thick enamel, so, uh, so they probably didn't, you know, wouldn't even, even with our diet, they probably would have done quite well. We have quite thin enamel on our teeth. Um, uh, and uh, this is a suite of characters that suggests that they were adapt, they had begun adapting to a uh, less energy rich and more, uh, uh, and, and a, di a diet that was less energy rich and more abrasive to the teeth. So suggestions have been, for example, seeds, uh, grasses, uh, roots and tubers, where there's lots of, uh, of grit and things that they ate. Um, and, uh, and that is suggested then to be an adaptation to the drying climate, where they were, you know, their predecessors would have eaten more fruit and soft leaves and things like that when there, when there was more forest. But when, uh, but when the uh, wood, savanna woodland spread, you got less of that and more of, uh, of m less energy rich and more abrasive foodstuffs. Uh, the other lineage, of course, is ourselves. And we've gone the other way. We have more delicate cheekbones. We have smaller jaws. We have smaller teeth than our predecessors, uh, all suggesting that we have a diet or began, even back you know, two and a half million years ago, began uh, shifting our diet to less, more energy rich food sources with less abrasive properties. And the one food source that immediately comes to mind when you talk about that sort of thing is meat. So meat has a lot of energy per food, per, per gram, if you will, and uh, is, very unabrasive. So they could, they could obtain more energy at less cost to their, uh, to their uh, dentition and would have le needed smaller chewing muscles to do it. Uh, so, and that's where we get to the, to the carnivores. So the question then is when did humans start moving into this uh, and, and perhaps dominate the carnivore niche. Well, 
if you look at if you look at what uh, sort of the, si the the nutrient cycle would more or less have looked at like back then, this is obviously very simplified things. You know, the climate climate and environment is is all pervasive, but uh, and affects the habitat and the resources in the habitat. The uh, herbivores eat these resources, uh, and the uh, the uh, prey or the, the predators eat these prey items, and there's a, regulatory, a, a mutual regulatory system between them, uh, which we know from, from, uh, from modern studies uh, that uh, you know, if, if the carnivores eat too many prey items, uh, then the next generation of carnivores will starve. Uh, so there will be fewer carnivores, and then the, predator, the, the herbivores will increase in, in, in population uh, and, uh, and then the whole the cycle starts over. So this is this is a not a stable system. This only actually becomes stable once you have many predators and many prey items. Uh, if you don't, then you get an oscillating system that can oscillate to extinction. Today, of course, we have you know, we have the same climate, we have the same habitat and resources, um, but then we have humans who take bits of everything. And that, of course, is, 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 our, is the dilemma that we have today, that there's much less uh, uh, available for the natural environment after we've taken our cut, which is becoming increasingly large as populations grow bigger. So African carnivores then. Uh, uh, here are some carnivores you've probably heard of, hyenas and lions. And, Cats and, cats and hyenas, there were many more cats and hyenas around, uh, say, three million, four, three, between three and four million years ago than there are today. But, and particularly since you had more species of hyenas and you had saber-toothed cats. So there were more of these uh, than there are today. Uh, this, uh, and then there's uh, a bunch of carnivores that you haven't heard of. These, this is the f sort of the fun part, at least for me. Uh, so we have giant otters. Uh, uh, there's a whole, a whole radiation of this gene is called anhydriodon uh, that um, would have uh, the biggest ones, such as this one, which is a species called anhydriodon dikike, uh, probably reached body masses greater than those of a lion, even the biggest lions. So you're talking about an otter that weighs somewhere on the order of 250 to 300 kilograms. Now, given that modern otters weigh, you know, the, the, the nice otters you see outside, or, or if you're lucky, will weigh maximum, you know, seven to 10 kilograms. That's, that's quite a big difference. So. Um, and then where there were giant civets, these are not so giant. Uh, but they were certainly larger than, uh, than modern civets. We have one from South Africa called Sahalictis, another one from uh, East Africa called Pseudocivetta. Uh, they probably could get up to body masses of something 30, 40 kilograms, whereas the largest civet today is about 15. So there's, again, a, a, a change. Things were bigger. And in Africa, at that time, in, uh, you know, between four and three million years ago, we also had bears. Uh, and uh, bears have subsequently have bears have only been present in the northernmost parts of North Africa as as European migrants. Uh, and North Africa is is really biogeographically a part of Europe anyway. Uh, so that's why I'm sticking to East and South Africa here. Um, so what do you do after you've analyzed after after you've identified all the carnivores that are there? Uh, and we have a pretty good record. Uh, it's not as bad as you might think. Uh, then do an analysis to try to identify not only the number of species that are there, which is an interesting fact in itself. You know, we have so many species, but also which, how many different kinds of carnivores were there, uh, and what, how many different roles do they fulfill in the environment? So, and that, that is, uh, then we are analyzing what we call functional richness rather than species richness. So to do this, uh, start out by generating what we call a morphous space. You do it, get some, uh, get some variables together, do a multivariate statistical analysis, uh, pick out the most meaningful uh, axes from a multivariate analysis, and this is what you get for all modern carnivores. 
And what we're seeing here is two axes. And this axis is a, a distinguishes between hypercarnivores, which are those carnivores that basically eat only meat. So you have, you have all these green uh, circles here are the cats. They're very specialized meat eaters. Uh, and then you have things in between. The red things here are dogs, which are, have teeth capable of eating both meat and vegetable matter. And over here you have procyonids, uh, such as raccoons and, and uh, olingos and uh, things that live mainly in, in, in uh, Central and South America, um, that are mainly fruit eaters. They, are, they belong to the order carnivora, but their diet includes very little meat and almost exclusively very soft uh, items that they grind down with large molar teeth. Um, and on this axis, we have animals up here that have uh, very long snouts, like dogs, uh, foxes, and things like that. Not, you know, not chihuahuas or, or, or uh, pugs or those things that we've, we've bred. To, um, and down here, we have animals like, uh, like some uh, mustelids and bears that have actually reduced snouts. Uh, with very few uh, premolar teeth. So this is sort of an ecological characterization of the order carnivora. And if we apply that to, uh, you do an analysis that includes the fossils in Africa. Uh, now, so to go back one, oops. There. Um, the next diagram I'm going to show you basically covers this sort of area. So this area is basically, it's not all of the, uh, all of the uh, modern area, but quite a large part of it. Uh, and this is what we see three to three and a half million years ago in Africa, that you know, we have we have some hypercarnivores, you know, bears and things, and the, but most of them are hy hypercarnivores. So this is where all the cats and hyenas end up. Uh, and today, this is all we have left. Uh, we have fewer of them, but this is all we have left in Africa. We don't have any bears, we don't have any giant otters, we don't have any giant civets, we don't have any omnivorous carn carnivores at all. Uh, all we have are these very specialized meat eaters. And this uh, diagram, and I'll show you here in a slightly more, oops, slightly more easily digested form. Uh, so this shows these, uh, the histogram here shows uh, the amount of the, the size of the, uh, of the uh, geometric uh, or the, the uh, convex hull. That's what I'm looking for, the convex hull that encloses all those species. So uh, up here, this is a ran obviously a random measurement just based on, on a, a, a diagram. But, uh, so up here, it's, it's, until we get to about two million years ago, it's quite large. Then all of a sudden, it dips to about half of what it was. And today, it's only about one or two percent of what it was. And so all the carnivores, all the large carnivores in Africa today are hyper-specialized for meat-eating. And that is a very un abnormal situation. It's not true of any other continent. It's not true of any other time. Uh, and it's not an artifact of the fossil record, which you know, it's easy to think, oh, well, we haven't found all these things. Uh, but if you look at the, the small carnivores, which are usually much harder to find, uh, it's not at all the same. Here you see what you would expect to see, which is what we call a pull of the recent. As you, as you go towards modern times, the fossil record gets a little bit better. So th the amount of space covered by small carnivores is larger. Whereas here, something really bad happened. And it's not climate. Uh, these are some, these are some really fresh, uh, some fresh uh, figures that uh, that were put together by, uh, by a group at, at the University of Helsinki that I'm collaborating with. 
to look at uh, mean annual temperature and later precipitation for um, the Turkana Basin, so the, the, fossil, the fossil areas around Lake Turkana in, in Africa. So this is mean annual temperature, and here, unfortunately, t uh, the past starts to the right, and we go to the left, where here we have the modern times. So what, but wh basically, what you're seeing is that there's, there's no real trend over this course of time. Um, basically, it was always hot. It's still hot. Uh, and there is some trend in precipitation, but by two million years ago, it's gone. And after two million years ago, there's basically hasn't been a lot of change. It's been dry. That's pretty much it. So uh, where we were, would ex be ex we, were, we were expecting to see major uh, shifts in uh, the climatic regime to coincide with these relatively dramatic changes in the fauna. We're not really seeing any of that. Um, and of course, we're, you know, we're still exploring the, the, this, uh, this uh, climatic space to, to uh, but, but basically, the indication here is that uh, climate, but biotic interactions have been important to the development of the uh, Eastern African ecosystems. And it's not just been climatic changes that the fauna has been reacting to. There's been internal, dramatic internal shifts as well. Uh, and uh, if we look at the time period, uh, the analyses, I've, I've tried to, to, to make the analyses I've done a little more precise. It's very difficult to do because of the fossil record. But it's, it's likely that these major changes to the carnivore guild, where, where the large carnivores sort of started disappearing, occur, started somewhat before two million years ago rather than somewhat after. So uh, around here, and that coincides with, with the appearance of, of these uh, m more modern, more sophisticated species of Homo. Slightly before them, but uh, we know that we usually end up finding earlier things once we start looking for them. Um, is the corroboration from other continents to some extent, yes. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on the late Pleistocene of North America, where there's been a, a huge debate over decades regarding whether uh, megafaunal extinctions at the end of the last ice age was due to uh, the appearance of humans and various types of you know, overkill, blitzkrieg, all sorts of ideas about, about how humans ravaged the landscape, or whether it was environment. Um, there, th it now, th the answer now seems to be that it's a bit of both, but certainly humans, humans triggered a rapid change in a system that was already starting to change. And in Europe, you know, the obvious question to ask there is, well, what happened when humans got to Europe, which the first humans appeared here about 1.3 million years ago, uh, only as transients, but. Uh, and then there is a, there's a, uh, seems to be a wave of permanent settlement around 900,000 years ago. Well, in both of those, at both of those time periods, uh, we actually see a dip in uh, the number of species of carnivores. They go down and then they go back up. They're not the same ones that, reap, that, that come back. So uh, something seems to be happening, although we haven't, you know, I have a, I'm going to be advertising a, a graduate student position to look at this question actually have the money for it. So the cl conclusions then, uh, carnivore extinctions at two million years ago selectively targeted certain species of carnivores. Uh, and uh, you know, the first thing we, that we saw in the diagrams is they were, made, they were specialized meat eaters. So they are the species that are the least in competition with humans. You know, if you have an, uh, an omnivore and you're you're an, you are an omnivore, you're going to be out competing the omnivore first, and then getting into the... And then there are also species that were... They are species that were direct dietary competitors with early humans, and also were a threat to them. So uh, they would be more like... Uh, and uh, a couple of other things are, are clear that of the specialized meat eaters that went extinct, they're the ones that were the most specialized, and that tends to mean that uh, they were more tied to a specific habitat, more tied to a specific uh, food items, 
had lower population sizes, et cetera, so they would be most, more vulnerable in general. Uh, the species that survived were those that adapted to human presence, uh, behaviorally and in other ways. And that is true today as well. Uh, things like leopards and lions and uh, animals like that are, are pretty well adapted to, to, to human. Uh, there were, I've recently there was a program on TV about, uh, about leopards in, uh, in, urban, in, in urban settings. Uh, and I know that uh, leopards live in the suburbs of Nairobi. Uh, and uh, I've recently learned, I was in Sri Lanka a few weeks ago, that that's also the case in Sri Lanka. There's an island that's one-sixth the size of Sweden and has a population of 600 leopards uh, and a population, human population of 21 million. They can get along, but uh, you actually you don't really know that the leopards are there because they're so cryptic. Anyway, the pattern that we see in Africa is distinct from the pattern that you would expect from climate change. And that doesn't prove anything, but at least it's an indication that there's there's something going on, there are species interactions going on that, that uh, are above and beyond what is triggered by climate change. So the suggestion is that there is a causal link between large carnivore extinction and competition with increasingly dominant early humans. And uh, obviously there must be effect, have been effects on this, of this on the other fauna. Uh, and that is something that is, remains to be analyzed. Uh, and we have to figure out ways to analyze that so that we can, again, distinguish between climatic effects and biotic interaction effects. But um, this is the end result of, you know, of, of what we did. Uh, so this is uh, the Turkana Basin, uh, Lake Turkana is over here somewhere. This is a bunch of cattle in a completely sterile, uh, the, these, these animals and the goats basically eat everything. There's n if, if we didn't have humans here, we, we didn't, didn't have grazing animals, um, this would be much greener. You know, there, would be, there would be trees here. It's not that dry, it's not that hot. Uh, and for a large part of the last five million years, that's the way it was. It was, it was hot uh, and it was dry, although maybe a little less dry than today. But this was uh, not, if not forested, at least plenty of trees, plenty of green, and this is, this is what we made it. So when did humans start to take over? Well, according to uh, my ideas, uh, humans started to, uh, to interfere here with this system around two million years ago, and although Originally, these things would have been eating those things. Uh, what then happened is that these things interfered with this connection and led to the demise of some of those things. So, some just a couple of final thoughts. That, according to this sort of analysis, uh, humans had the ability to affect ecosystems on a major scale for two million years. And in that sense, the Anthropocene uh, is much older than people have generally suggested. Uh, and in fact, there, there have been, th this has been mentioned sort of vaguely in, in, in one paper, suggesting that anything that happened, you know, that we have the Anthropocene, and then we have the Paleoanthropocene, uh, perhaps a word that I would want to avoid, but, uh, but I would rather like to say that perhaps the Anthropocene is really better perceived as an ongoing process. It's continually changing. Any, any attempt to subdivide it is completely arbitrary. Uh, and you know, we, may, we may want to do that, but why? It sort of obscures the process as such, because you know, if you set a dividing line, say the Anthropocene starts here, well, you can say, well, before then, okay, we didn't do anything before then. It's just after, after this period, after this time. So, uh, uh, so uh, even though I'm a, you know, I did train as a geologist, I'm not very good at geology, and now I'm going to be, going to be uh, fighting with geologists over the concept of the Anthropocene. Thank you.